Welcome to Old World Order Theology with Brian Newberry. Today I'm going to be giving some of my personal testimony, maybe in reverse order. In my first episode, I did give some testimony of why I became a Catholic when I used to become, when I used to be a Protestant. Uh, this time, I'm going to give some personal experiences and reasons why I became what is known today it, as a trad Catholic or a traditional Catholic. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to use uh, that distinction because oftentimes what is portrayed as what is Catholic is not really as Catholic as it should be, or if you want to use a zero-sum uh, way of thinking, it's not Catholic at all. So I'll give a little bit of my background before that because it's relevant. I was a Protestant for 20 years. I even attended a Protestant uh, seminary, a Wesleyan seminary. And about halfway through, uh, I realized uh, that my theology was very close to Catholic theologies, especially soteriology and, you know, taking into consideration historical context for the scriptures and not reading it uh, with the background of 21st century Western civilization mindset and having a little bit of understanding of why American Catholicism, I'm, I'm sorry, why American Christianity uh, seems so different from the Christianity of the first few centuries. Uh, reading the early church fathers, it seemed very different. So I began to ask questions, you know, why is it different? Why do we, you know, why are our church services a lot different? Because uh, the early Christians uh, had liturgy, they had the Eucharist, they believed that the Eucharist uh, was contained the real uh, presence of Christ. Uh, they had uh, popes, bishops, priests, deacons, and, and all kinds of other things that really didn't sit too well with uh, American Christianity. And then also, re you know, reading some of Martin Luther Luther's quotes and ideas, it didn't really seem to be very biblical after uh, close scrutiny. So, yeah, I, I kind of realized uh, that my theology is very close to Catholicism, although I didn't embrace everything that Catholicism uh, taught initially, even you know, after I had converted, I still had some reservations. And, you know, personal experiences also contributed a lot to my conversion to Catholicism and even becoming a traditional Catholic. Uh, for example, during this time of contemplating conversion, you know, my wife was undergoing treatment for uh, breast cancer, so it was a very somber time in my life, very contemplative time, and a time of crisis, you know, and when God wants to communicate with us, uh, He doesn't do it in only one way, you know, or when, when, when He really wants to communicate with us. I'm not saying that He can't communicate in various ways, but when He really wants to send us a message, when He really wants us to when he brings us to the fork in the road, we can't take the fork. We have to choose one way or the other. We can't uh, continue in error. We cannot continue going against our own conscience. And we can't continue uh, deceiving ourselves and thinking something is true when it really isn't. So coincidentally, at the time, I was also looking for a school for my children. Uh, my oldest child, my son, was entering kindergarten, and my daughter was, uh, you know, in the grade below in what we call early kindergarten. And I was looking for a nice Christian school they can go to because the public schools in California are just, uh, uh, they're, they're so wicked and they're so perverse with their philosophy and everything. I, I wasn't going to subject my very young children to that. So being blessed and fortunate as I was to be able to afford, hopefully afford, a Christian school for them, I was looking around and I really couldn't find a Christian school that was affordable with all of our other expenses. Uh, the only affordable 
Christian school was a Catholic school, you know, coincidentally, right? As I'm kind of realizing that my theology is pretty close to Catholic theology. The only school for my children to go to that I could afford is a Catholic school. So I applied. I figured, oh, what the heck, even if I have some disagreements with the Catholic Church, uh, so I thought at the time, I, I figured uh, I could just put that off to the side and at least it was better than public school. So that was the plan, at least then. And then, in order for my children to go to the school, I had to have a meeting with the pastor, with the, with the father, and for this uh, video, I'm going to give a pseudonym. I'm just going to call him Father John. I don't want to mention any names. So we met, and he was very impressed uh, me being a seminarian. He was very happy uh, to meet with me, and happy that my children were going to the uh, diocesan school in, in his charge. But he also, he spoke to me, and I actually believe that he was speaking in persona Christi, even though he wasn't in, you know, in the liturgical uh, format. I believe that Christ uh, spoke through him. He said, for the sake of your children, you must become Catholic. He says, it's very important for your, your whole house uh, to have the same beliefs. And it was at that point that I realized he's right. I should become Catholic. Even if I had some reservations with some of the doctrines. And I, I even shared that with him and and. He didn't seem to have a problem with that. Uh, and, you know, I, a few weeks later, I told him I do want to convert and to, to be a Catholic, even though in my mind at the time, I didn't really con see it as, as so much of a conversion. So, but in this case, it would actually be a reversion because I was a baptized Catholic. And when I told him that, you know, he said, uh, you still have a lot of Protestant thinking in your mind. He says, you need to become more Catholic. And I really took that to heart. I didn't take it as an insult because I knew he was right. So I began to do my due diligence. I thought, well, if my children are going here, I'm going to become Catholic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a Catholic authored church history book. And so I did. Uh, being in a, a very somber mindset with my wife undergoing cancer treatment, I had really no desire to watch TV or to uh, do any extracurricular activities that were really fun. So I began to read up, began to study. And I realized that a lot of my previous perceptions of Catholicism were distorted by propaganda, anti-Catholic propaganda. For example, I remember as a very young man, I read a book by, well, I can't even remember his name, oh, Dave Hunt, called The Woman That Rides the Beast. So it was a propaganda piece against the Catholic Church, and according to even many Protestants, it was very shoddy uh, scholarly work, even though it had a lot of footnotes. It basically said that you know, the Catholic Church uh, was the woman that rides the beast in Revelation 17, and the popes were the Antichrist, and and all that kind of stuff. That the Catholic Church was evil, worshipped idols, all of those kind of things. So uh, that really affected me in my in my younger days, and especially being having a rebellious nature. Uh, it really fit kind of my own uh, personal autonomy, and you know, kind of going my own way. It kind of fit that uh, that mold, so I embraced it. Uh, it wasn't really until studying in seminary, that, you know, even studying a lot of uh, theology uh, writ written by uh, Catholic authors, uh, whether it be biblical commentaries or theological articles, uh, they were written by Catholic authors, and I always thought they were superior to most of the articles and commentaries written by Protestant authors. And so, with that being said, I want to give experience that I had with Father John and the parish that I went to originally, uh, where my children went to school and as of today still go to school there. It is a parish that is, uh, relatively speaking, uh, liberal. They embrace a lot of uh, 
liberal ideology. The priests are somewhat theologically liberal, or at least at the time when I was going there. There's a new priest there now, so Father John is no longer there. So let me give an experience, some of my experiences with Father John, and then I'll give some experiences with the other priest uh, that, that celebrates Mass there. So Father John... Like I said, he didn't really have a problem with me having some theological beliefs that were contrary to Catholic dogma. And at that point, I didn't really uh, have a full grasp or understanding of uh, what Catholic dogmas really meant. See, being a seminarian, I, I was under the understanding that theologians had all kinds of disagreeing and contradicting viewpoints, and that... Uh, it was okay in you know in at least in the realm of theology and discussion among theologians to have disagreements and even sometimes challenge dogmas if we could understand things better which of course presumes uh, that uh, some kind of an evolutionary uh, view of truth and dogma which right now i firmly reject and right now and forevermore so one of my uh, heretical theological beliefs that I had at the time was something called as canonic Christology, which is a heresy. Uh, and I even told Father John that, you know, that Jesus had emptied out in his human nature some of his divine attributes. Uh, so he wasn't omniscient and he wasn't able to be omnipresent and so forth. Uh, you know, and that even kind of, uh, it fits with the passage in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 where it says that Christ emptied himself uh, you know of his divine nature uh, and appeared as a, in the form of a slave but he did so willingly it's not it, there's a fine line he did empty himself out in the sense that he could have fulfilled the fullness of his divine nature in his human form but uh, in his human nature he he was a baby, you know, he needed his diaper change, he had to submit to authority, and he had to learn as a child, he had to be taught, and so forth, you know, but the official Catholic teaching on that is that uh, he still had the divine nature within him, but as a representative of the human race, he willingly and uh, chose to, to go about it in that way, so that and, and the canonic Christology also denies that Christ had two minds and two wills. I also had a problem with that, which is heretical. I've repented and recanted since then. But Father John didn't really have a problem with that when I shared that with him. You know, he, in my opinion, looking back, he should have politely corrected me. Okay, another thing about Father John and our early meetings, he told me that the best Catholic theologian of the 20th century was Karl Rahner, S.J. I never had heard of him at that time, so I did some research on Karl Rahner, and even then, I wasn't very impressed. It seemed that some of his theology seemed to be pantheistic in nature, you know, having you know, the, the belief that Christ at his incarnation bound every human being to himself uh, by virtue of his incarnation that seemed very pantheistic of course uh, he christ did not uh, bind every human being to himself at the incarnation he in fact bound himself to humanity but as far as human beings being in communion with christ there are conditions for that you know, if anything it's the atonement that made that possible and not the incarnation. And there are some other beliefs by Karl Rahner which uh, are actually reprehensible when you think about it. Uh, at one point, he denied the actual bodily resurrection of Christ, and he was very liberal in his theology. One of the Rhine Fathers uh, who influenced the Second Vatican Council and, and so you could do some research on Karl Rahner. I don't want to get bogged down in all the details. But in any case, Father John thought he was a great theologian. And it, that was a little bit uh, troubling when I really found out who Karl Rahner was. Father John also did not believe 
that the judgment on Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, Father John did not believe that that was a judgment on Judaism and the Jews. He told me, because there was a homily given by the other priest, who I'll, I'll get to in a minute, who explicitly denied that, and you know, because he was uh, trying to divert uh, the faithful away from calling, refer thinking of Jews as Christ killers and so forth, and and that's fine if you're trying to uh, prevent people from being anti-Semitic, uh, properly speaking. But nevertheless, 70 A.D. The destruction of Jerusalem and and uh, the temple was absolutely a judgment on Judaism and the Jews, who, for the most part, rejected Jesus as Messiah. In fact, Jesus predicted that it would happen uh, 40 years earlier in the Olivet Discourse. And he speaks uh, in the Olivet Discourse, it's, it's based on an eschatological type of judgment, uh, judging the unbeliever. Uh, the wrath of God being manifest. And the early church fathers also believed that. So when I, you know, politely confronted Father John on that, you know, he, he told me he was trying not, he was trying to avoid the discussion. He was trying to divert, to redirect. He's saying, oh, the Romans were just being mean. But then I, I pressed him a little bit. I said, in the Old Testament, uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed the first time by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, the scripture explicitly says that Nebuchadnezzar was God's instrument of wrath on apostate Judah. And Father John, he said something to me that really shocked me. My jaw just dropped. He said, that's just what people believed back then. So basically he was denying the infallibility of the Bible. And then there was another incident uh, actually, the first time I went to confession with Father John, you know, he, he actually recognized my voice and he asked if he could uh, put aside the curtain, which is a little bit odd. I've never had any priest do that ever since, uh, but I guess that's kind of a new thing going on. Usually the, the priest should not want to know who is confessing so that he could be objective in his penance. And when he asked me if what my sins were, he, he posed it as, do you have any skeletons in your closet? Anything major to confess? Because uh, I was about to confess, you know, I hadn't been to confession in 20 years. I, I was about to say, I've committed every sin except for literally murdering a person. I, and I literally have. I've committed every sin, all the Ten Commandments and uh, just about everything within it. I mean, I've never molested children either. I'll, I'll say that. Never molested children. I've never literally killed a person. But just about everything else you could think of, uh, in one way or another, I've, I've sinned. And I was about to tell him that. And he told me, he said, Brian, God has already forgiven you all of your sins. He says, but the good thing about confession is psychologically it's important for you to hear the words, your sins are absolved. So basically, he was implying that confession was a psychological mechanism to rid one of self-guilt. In essence, he was denying the sacrament as it was properly known. I, I don't know if he actually believes that uh, the sacrament really absolves sins, but his words seem to apply otherwise, that God has already forgiven me without the necess necessity of the sacrament, which would actually contradict the infallible Council of Trent. That's another thing that kind of, I it didn't really bother me at the time, but looking back at it, it bothers me. And here's probably the final thing that really, uh, actually, and it was directly against me, or indirectly against me, uh, by Father John, because I'd actually become a catechist. Uh, you know, he blessed uh, me and my fellow catechists in the RCIA, and I taught in RCIA for three years before I finally uh, resigned because of uh, my conscientious objection to uh, the Novus Ordo Mass, especially the way it was celebrated there. 
one day in RCIA, I taught the doctrine, and it was according to the reading of the day, of extra ecclesium nalus salus, which means there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. And, and I didn't say anything like everyone who's not Catholic is going to hell. I didn't say that. I, I just said that anyone in heaven is Catholic. There are no Protestants in heaven. Uh, there are no Buddhists in heaven. There are no atheists in heaven. There are no Hindus in heaven, and so forth. I said it's possible uh, through uh, ignorance or invincible ignorance, uh, or for whatever other reason, God can grant pardon to people who didn't die as Catholics. I said that. But I said, nevertheless, the, ter the church has always taught there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. And that upset some of the other RCIA catechists. Not everyone, uh, just a few. And they went around asking other, pr they, asked, they went to Father John, of course, and other priests. And, you know, it just so happened to be that was the weekend of the religious education conference in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, which is, if anyone knows anything about that, it's an uber literal event that happens every year. And for some reason, the, the bishops in Los Angeles play along. Uh, but I, dig I digress. So these people went around asking priests, and even bishops, about uh, no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. And they assured uh, this person and these persons that the Catholic Church does not teach that, of course. And what do you know, the next time that we went to Mass as an, as an RCIA group, guess what the homily was about? The homily was by Father John. It denied extra ecclesium nalus salus. It didn't come out and say it like that. It didn't come out and say that that they deny uh, there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. In the homily, Father John said that he had a friend of his that recently passed away who is a Baptist and who was very devout and sincere in his belief in Jesus Christ. And Father John, in front of the entire congregation in his homily, said that he has no doubts that his Baptist friend is in heaven. Now, what he said in the homily is heresy, because the Council of Trent dogmatically and infallibly declares that the presumption of salvation is anathema. It's, uh, we do not presume salvation, not even the most faithful Catholics. We hope in salvation, and we may have reasonable belief if we die in a state of grace that we will go to heaven. might be some purgatory in there, but we are not to declare anyone Catholic, and priests and bishops are not allowed to canonize people. They're not even allowed to canonize Catholics, Never, much less uh, a non-Catholic. But Father John canonized his Baptist friend in a homily. He said, without a doubt, he's in heaven. So all of these things contributed to me uh, distancing myself from Father John and what I call Novus Ordo Catholicism, meaning Vatican II uh, uh, construct of Catholicism. Okay, let's go to the other priest at the parish. I'm, for the sake of the video, I'm not going to use his real name. I'm just going to call him Father Bill. Uh, when, immediately, you notice Father Bill, when he says the Nicene Creed at Mass, he uses gender-neutral pronouns. So, for example, instead of, uh, for us men in our salvation, he came down from heaven. He doesn't say, for us men in our salvation. He says, for us humans in our salvation, he came down from heaven and, you know, and became human, not man. So he, he switches the, the words of the, the Nicene Creed and he replaces them with politically correct gender-neutral pronouns. Now, of course, anybody with half a brain knows that when it says became human or became man, that it means that Jesus became a human. And when it says for us men and for our salvation, it doesn't mean males only. It means humanity. Everybody knows that. So it really is highly unnecessary 
and also uh, forbidden for the priest to change the arbitrarily change the liturgy. Now, perhaps he got permission from the bishop to do that, but in any case, it's scandalous uh, to the Catholic faith to change the words of the liturgy. It's, it's improper. It's, a, it's against canon law. And then sometime later, he went even further, and he, during the Apostles' Creed, he omitted the filioque. So instead of saying, you know, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, he went the Greek Orthodox route and says he proceeded from the Father through the Son which is not theologically erroneous, but it's not the, the Roman Catholic Nicene Creed. So he's purposely doing that, you know, and this has a lot to do with the uh, false ecumenism promoted by uh, the Vatican II construct of Catholicism. And word must have got around because I was asking some people about him changing the creed because later on in homily he justified him omitting the filioque or altering altering it. He justified it by saying Pope John Paul II did the same thing when he met with the when he communed with the Greek Orthodox. So I'm not sure if that's the best example to justify that but in any case that's what he did. And Father Bill, another thing about him uh, Virtually all of his homilies, he was preaching the political talking points of the Democratic Party. Every single time, he, every opportunity he had from any of the readings, he would preach pro-immigration. We need to accept all people, all immigrants, uh, and never, you know, without question or without suspicion. He would constantly preach the inclusion of pro-LGBT peoples. We don't have to agree with all their behavior, he says, but we should accept them. And also uh, the poor and others, uh, you know, the, uh, the other, the, the outsider, which is fine and dandy, but he went overboard with it. He exploited the, the readings for the day, the scriptural readings, and he always found opportunity to include those in there. And because of that, I'm sure there are a lot of liberal Catholics in the congregation who really loved him for that. But I also know personally uh, a lot of fellow Catholics who have been tempted to walk out during the homily, and maybe they've even done it. Uh, so in any case, that's it. Just it becomes constantly uh, an issue when you, you never really talk about uh, Catholic doctrines or Catholic. Uh, practices other than the kind of pro-social justice warrior construct. And then, you know, later to find out that, you know, uh, the United States bishops receive about 40% of their income from federal grants, uh, and a lot of that money they use to teach immigrants English, which is fine and dandy, but it's not something that's exclusively Catholic. So uh, you would think that the bishops have a lot of other things to do, a lot of uh, things on their plate that that were that are explicitly Catholic that they should be dealing with and not you know giving language classes to immigrants which can be done by anybody so that would explain why the constant pro-immigration message because uh, they're supporting their patrons uh, meaning uh, the federal uh, government is explicitly the Democratic Party because uh, Father Bill also said one time he's like you know there, there are pro-life Democrats by the way so he's basically saying that you know he votes Democrat, and he justifies it by saying there are such things as pro-life Democrats. Although even though the party platform explicitly endorses abortion as a as a woman's right, which as a Catholic we we cannot as Catholics we cannot vote for pro-abortion candidates, and we shouldn't really vote for a political party with that on their political platform because then we run the risk of sharing in the guilt of the blood of babies. But I digress. What else did, did Father Bill preach on constantly? He constantly preached about his atheist friends and his Buddhist friends who, you know, who were so righteous and so kind and so caring, and he always would say he expected them to be in heaven. So again, he's presuming... Uh, eternal life and salvation to people who aren't even Catholic, which goes explicitly against the Council of Trent. So th those are some of the things that 
Father Bill preached on that really got to me, and I, I cannot leave out the one where I actually confronted him with after Mass. And mind you, I'm not a confrontational person by nature, so it really takes something to irk me to really confront you to your face. And, and I did. After Mass, during the homily, uh, uh, the Gospel reading was about Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. If you know, if you know that narrative, uh, this, a woman who's not a Jew, she's a Gentile from the Syrophoenician area, which is Tyre and Sidon in northern uh, Israel. And she had a daughter who was demon-possessed. And she goes to Jesus, begging him to heal her daughter. And Jesus says, it is not right for me to give to dogs, which, uh, which, isn't, which are intended to be given to the children of Israel. You know, it's basically saying, uh, you're a Gentile, I'm sent first to the Jews because I'm their Messiah. And the woman persists and says, well, even dogs eat the scraps off their master's table. So this woman, even after Jesus gives her an ethnic insult, you could say a racial slur even, because uh, the Jews called, they referred to Gentiles as dogs. So that is, that is a racial slur. The woman isn't offended. She doesn't get butt hurt. She doesn't start protesting. She persists because she loves her daughter. She has faith that Jesus can heal her. And Jesus says, your faith has saved your daughter. You know, and he exercises the demons out of her daughter. So Father Bill takes opportunity to say that it was at this point, at this moment in Jesus' life, in his human nature, that he realized that Gentiles were to be included in the gospel. And I just about lost it. Now, I realize this is a common teaching in the, the Jesuit circle, uh, which is very liberal. Uh, the Jesuits often teach these kind of things. So Father Bill took, he exploited the gospel. The message is persistence with prayer and asking God for things that you think he should do. That's the message of that, that uh, pericope. But Father Bill exploits it as a pro-inclusion, you know, kind of pro-others, pro-immigration uh, inclusion message. He, and and it, in doing so, he spoke heresy because Jesus, because the, the, even the modern CCCC, uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, promulgated by John Paul II, explicit, explicitly says that according to his mission, Jesus always knew what his mission was. He explicitly states that, or the catechism explicitly states that. And there's no indication in the scriptures that Jesus learned from this woman that he, his mission at that point were to include the Gentiles too. No. And I confronted Father Bill after Mass. I said, look, I said, I don't think that Jesus realized that in, even in his human nature. And of course, Father Bill is very combative. He he didn't really even want let me to speak. He he was saying, it's like a, you know, I ha, I basically had to interrupt him. I was like in in Luke's gospel, in chapter four at the beginning of his mission, he includes Gentiles uh, as part of the mission. In fact, that's why the Jews uh, they try to kill him in Luke chapter four because Jesus makes reference in the Old Testament to the prophets who could have ministered to Israelites and instead they administered to Gentiles. And Father Bill kind of, he wasn't expecting that response. And he says, well, you do realize that uh, different each gospel has a specific audience and a specific theology. And I was like, I, I was like, I can grant that, Father, but you can't deny that Jesus uh, knew that his mission included Gentiles from the very beginning without denying uh, what the scriptures are really saying, the infallible scriptures, right? And even the Old Testament especially the book of Isaiah, constantly, especially in the latter half, includes Gentiles as being you know, included into Israel, into true Israel, to the people of God. And Jesus quotes from Isaiah more than any other book except for the Psalms. So Jesus is very, 
he's very versed. He's well versed in Isaiah. I mean, obviously, as the second person of the Trinity, he's the author of Scripture. But even in his human nature, he knows Isaiah inside out. So it, it's ludicrous and also heretical to say that Jesus, in his human nature, learned at the you know during he learned from a Gentile woman uh, that Gentiles were to be included. No, that's nonsense. That's garbage. So those are my two encounters with the two priests at the parish, uh, which really, you know, God was showing me that uh, this parish was barely Catholic, if, if, it, if it's Catholic at all. And I could even go into other of the things that happened, like uh, Protestant hymns in the hymnal, uh, girl altar boys being the norm. Uh, you know, they wanted me to be an extraordinary minister, you know, of the Eucharist, uh, and I went to the class, and there were about 35 or more people in the class, which didn't really seem that extraordinary to me. You know, coincidentally, at the same time, I was reading the Council of Trent, uh, and that, you know, that excluded lay persons from touching the Eucharist, uh, much less ministering to it, except for in the most extraordinary circumstances, such as the ship is going down and we need to get the Eucharist out. That's that's what extraordinary means. And I eventually kind of made the observation that the parish is ran by women. Uh, it was being influenced by women. And the men were submissive. And that's kind of uh, an inversion of what uh, the scriptures say. Uh, you know, for example, you know, there's a woman who would come into the RCIA and she would constantly say, make reference to, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am present with you. Of course, in the, in the context of the gospel, that has to do with church discipline, and it's not, it has, doesn't really have to do with the laity so much. And she also, this, this same woman also said that, uh, she's like, oh, in the old days, you know, women had to submit to the men and the, the wives had to submit to their husbands, but she said that was outdated. So that's just, a, that's, that's modernism, you know, the, the assumption of the evolution of doctrine, dogma, truth. Okay, so those are my personal experiences that push me away from the Novus Ordo construct or the Vatican II construct of Catholicism. So what are some of the more objective things? Well, being a person who is on social media a lot, and Facebook especially, uh, I encountered some traditional Catholic groups on Facebook and some of their ideas at first, they seemed to be very harsh. You know, they were rigid. They didn't compromise. They weren't reasonable, you know, because being a theologian, a lay theologian, someone who went to seminary, uh, you know, we were used to hearing diverse opinions on certain things, but they, oh, no, these, these guys, you know, it had to be only one way. You know, dog, if anything that, you know, in the least bit deviated from dogma, you know, we weren't even allowed to consider it. And I was a little bit shocked at first. I wasn't used to hearing it like that. But, you know, as I did my research, you know, remember I took the uh, Father John's advice. He says, I need to become more Catholic. You know, as I did my research, I kind of realized that the early Catholics were like that. You know, they, they didn't say that Muslims profess to wor worship the same God that we, you know, along with us. Uh, they, they called Muslims... Uh, they called Muhammad the prophet of Satan, right? That they worship a different god. That's very different from what the, the CCCC has to say about it and the Novus Ordo Vatican II construct of Catholicism. And, you know, I was reading and listening to lectures by the late Michael Davies, uh, reading from H.J.I. Sire. I was reading Denzinger's uh, Sources of Catholic Dogma, which has all of the early creeds. It has all of the dogmatic uh, ecumenical councils, and it has all the major points of the major encyclicals of the popes uh, throughout the ages. So all these things kind of, uh, they informed me of what Catholicism really was. And I began to see, in the same way that I saw that American Christianity deviated from the earliest Christians, I began to see deviations from the post-Vatican II Catholic Church from what Catholicism had always been from AD 33 to 1965. And then I began to look into some of the Vatican II documents 
and I began to have some eyebrow raising questions uh, that seemed to deviate. Like for example, in the Council of Florence, it said that if anyone is not united to the Roman pontiff, then he cannot be saved. That's dogma. We cannot deviate from that. But in the Vatican II doc documents, it says that uh, Protestants, by their own efforts and their services, can uh, contribute to salvation. You know, other than them administering Catholic baptism, you know, that's not possible uh, because. Once you start uh, believing, once you become of the age of reason and you believe in heresy, uh, you've actually uh, excommunicated yourself, ipso facto. So, you know, I, I, things like that, I began to see, you know, re religious liberty and, and so forth contradict earlier documents uh, of the Catholic Church. And then I began to stumble upon things about the infiltration of Freemasons and communists in the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, the Alta Vendita in the 19th century, the Bella Dada and the communists uh, coming into the seminaries, which had a, an impact on Vatican II Council, the kind of uh, modernists uh, that influenced the council, and also even the uh, sexual abuse, uh, the pederasty going on in the priesthood, all of that having ties to the infiltration. And then not to mention all of the scandalous statements by Pope Francis that contradicted uh, Catholicism uh, proper from AD 33 to 1965. And then, you know, culminating in his uh, permitting uh, idols uh, in Rome and in the churches, uh, the Pachamama incidents. So, you know, all of these things kind of contributed uh, to my uh, becoming a so-called trad Catholic you know, mind you, in the beginning when I converted, I thought Pope Francis was great. I thought he was a breath of fresh air. You know, he seemed so humble. You know, he would wash the feet of prisoners uh, during Holy Thursday. Uh, he didn't live in the Vatican Palace. He lived in an apartment. You know, those are the kind of things, you know, that Jesus might have done. I thought, oh, this is a good Pope. But then he started talking. He started teaching. And at first I tried to defend him. It's like, oh, well, maybe the media is taking his words out of context. You know, they, the media is anti-Catholic and so forth. But uh, after 10 or 12 things that he said that were at least potentially scandalous, uh, if not heretical, materially speaking, uh, I, I couldn't defend it anymore without violating my own sense of integrity and my own sense of you know, intellectual consistency. And I kind of, I, I began to connect the dots, I began to see all these things. And with all of my research and my Facebook friends in these Catholic circles who I, you know, whenever they would prove their point, they, would, they wouldn't they would give me some crazy tinfoil hat wearing uh, voice on YouTube who said it. They, they would give me Catholic sources, you know, firsthand sources, primary sources. So they weren't a bunch of conspiratorialists. They weren't a bunch of you know far right uh, advocates uh, ad advocating you know alt rightism or, or anything white nationalism any any garbage like that. They gave me Catholic sources, and I began to see the contrast between the Vatican II documents and what happened after the Vatican II Council and what had been going on in the Church uh, for almost two thousand years before that. And I came to the fork in the road and I had to decide, am I going to continue to go take the easy path, the path of being a catechist on the RCIA whom everybody respected because he knew the Bible so well? Or are all these things that God is showing me? And I had to check myself. It was, it was not an easy decision because I had lots of friends there that I had to more or less say goodbye to as far as seeing them all the time and, and joining them in meals and, and so forth. I kind of had to say goodbye because I thought it was, objectively speaking, the right thing to do. I, ha I actually had to swallow my own pride. I had to die to myself because I could have been popular. I could have been a somebody. You know, I, I could have been you know, the face of the parish if I would have continued going down that road. You know, I, I, had, I have charisma. I have the knowledge, and I'm young. I'm not. I'm not old. You know, I could appeal to young people. 
but I couldn't, I couldn't violate my conscience. I couldn't go against the things that were so obvious to me intellectually. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas says, you know, the, the intellect thinking abstractly, that's how Catholics ought to be thinking. You know, we can't, we can't be going by our emotions and, you know, what's easiest and what's, you know, what, what can get me in a higher place. Because it, I could have done those things if I would have just went with the flow, if I would have just went along with it. You know, we can't assume that the Holy Spirit is behind everything that always happens in the Catholic Church. There is such a thing as free will. And then if you really want to get into the the visions and the apparitions of the, Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, like Fatima, uh, and so forth, uh, that, that prophesy that the church would go into, you know, go into near uh, apostasy. Uh, you, have, you have to realize what's going on. You know, and, you know, it, with a very heavy heart, and even with my family even suffering through it, because not everybody, you know, in my family and in my household is theologically oriented. You know, my wife's not a theologian. She's a virtuous woman. But as far as the theology stuff, you know, some of it's a little bit too too deep for her. You know, some, God doesn't make everybody like that. You know, so, you know, for her to go from being a Protestant, then reverting to Catholicism, which actually she had no resistance to revert to Catholicism because both of us are baptized Catholics. But then after that to have to go, oh, now we don't go to the Novus Ordo Mass. We only go to Latin Mass. Women have to cover their heads and, and so forth, or not have to. If you go to diocesan uh, Latin Mass, it, it's still optional. Uh, but you know, but all of these changes, it's very, you know, on her is very taxing. Uh, and it was taxing on me too, but, you know, nevertheless, I have to trust God. I have to trust, you know, what he showed me. I have to trust uh, God's grace, uh, give, giving me the grace to understand these things intellectually. Uh, and a lot of people since then have, they think that I'm more arrogant now. They think uh, I'm more prideful now, that I'm more self-righteous now. No, not at all. It's actually the opposite. I'm less because I don't have a theology of my own anymore. When I was in seminary, uh, the seminarians all kind of prided of, you know, prided themselves being proud of having their own grasp on theology, their own spin on it, their own twist on it. I don't have my own theology anymore. I accept what's been handed down to me by the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, uh, that which can never change. We can deepen our understanding of it, but we can't contradict it. We can't change it can't go in a different direction, especially when that direction has produced nothing but bad fruit and the closing down of our parishes and, and the closing down of our uh, our religious orders, which used to help the poor. And now where the Catholic Church once helped the poor, now the state has taken over and we have socialism. All these things are so obvious. I don't have any self-righteousness. That's nonsense. Any righteousness that I have, it's because God's given me the grace and I have to cooperate with that grace. It's not because I understand better than everybody else. That's nonsense. My understanding is nothing but what has been handed down to me since the beginning. I accept it, I embrace it, and I have the soldier's mentality is, you give me the orders, church, bride of Christ, you give me the teachings, you give me the orders, and I obey. And I'm not going to deviate. I'm not going to compromise so that people feel better. That's not charitable. If you're charitable, you tell the truth at all times. You be the truth. You do the truth. So saying things that make people feel better, flattering them, going with the flow for the sake of peace, but yet we compromise principles. We can't do that. I can't do that. I'm not more arrogant. I'm just more confident that God has revealed all truth. John 16, 13. The paraclete, the Holy Ghost, would guide the church into all truth. All truth means 100% without error. That's what all means. That's what truth means. The nature of truth is rigid because it does not permit any error whatsoever. The gates of hell shall never prevail against the church founded on St. Peter, the rock. The gates of hell... 
meaning false doctrine. In ancient times, gates are where the juridical decisions were made, juridic, juridical uh, decisions were made for the city. False doctrine would be the gates of hell. Falsehood comes from hell and Satan. That will never prevail. So to assume that the church was wrong in doctrine uh, back in the days on various points, but now it's right, is fallacious. Because if the church was wrong regarding doctrine, faith, and morals at one point, then who's to say that we're not wrong today and won't need to be corrected again in the future? You can't, can't have it both ways. Either the church was always correct on doctrine, faith, and morals, making Jesus' promises be true, or Jesus' promises are not true, or we've greatly misunderstood them, and the church can be wrong on doctrine, faith, and morals, and we're still in the process of discovering truth. But no, that goes against the idea of the deposit of faith given once and for all to the apostles. See the epistle of Jude. Deposit means something that's given. Something that's given can't be wrong at one point and then right at another and then subject to further change. Either it's right entirely the first time with the first deposit, or it's not. Again, we can have further discoveries and deepen those things that were, that were given to us, but we cannot change course. We cannot contradict it. So that's my testimony of why I am a traditional Catholic. Please like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. God bless you. Nomine Patris, Filii, Spiriti Sancti. Amen.